and also social vulnerability, um, and particularly to nub this really of social vulnerability for women in terms of lack of sexual autonomy and men's sexual power and privilege and, and how those really contribute to women's vulnerability to HIV. And as we're all very familiar with this, it's been, it was both radical, but also it's been incre incredibly successful in moving us from understandings of individual risk to structural influences and understanding how a whole series of different things influence vulnerability and risk in different ways through different mechanisms. And it's been successful in that we can think of a whole of a range of interventions which have come out from these complex understandings, so female-initiated methods such as microbicides, as well as access to education, microfinance initiatives. So having said that, increasingly there's been a reflection upon the differences in the way we approach understanding HIV risk in women in comparison to men. And I've put a, uh, a reference there at the bottom, <coughs> um, Higgins, Hoffman, Dawkins, of a, of a very good paper which sums up some reflections upon the differences in the way we approach understanding HIV risk between men and women. And these authors talk about really how they consider that there's been an inadequate conceptualization of how structural factors and social vulnerability influence men's vulnerability to HIV, uh, that in a lot of literature and intervention even, that men are, are portrayed as unaffected and invulnerable. There's still a predominance of biological essentialism. In one journalist during the 2006 International AIDS Conference in Toronto wrote that changing the behavior of African men is probably hopeless, and so it's better to focus on working with women because it's more likely to bring about change. And it's the idea that <clears throat> both it's incredibly difficult to work with men and also that there's a certain um, innateness about behavior which is difficult to change. And as a result, we can think about the ways in which men have not been given the skills or tools to protect themselves and their partners from HIV. When we think about interventions with men, we can think about, again, the, the um, predominance of biological ideas and biologic, biomedical interventions such as male circumcision condom distribution and knowledge-based uh, interventions, although increasingly we can say that there is some change to more complex understandings. So really the challenge is to think about <clears throat> the ways in which biology, social structure and gender relations lead to complex complexities in men's risk of HIV, and increasingly there are calls to understand the structural factors and the ways in which social vulnerability impacts upon HIV, HIV vulnerability for both men and women, but for different reasons and through different mechanisms. And while making this point, it's still key to say that maintaining a focus upon men as participants in a system of gender inequality is, is really important. It doesn't negate any of, any of that. Uh, that is an important thing to be working on but it says perhaps we need to think in a bit more depth about the complexities of men's risk. So I'm going to talk about the study I did and how it tried to draw out some of these issues. Um, and so the focus of the study was really to understand the mechanisms through which structural factors shape the behavior of men in Dharavi, which is an area of Mumbai, India. The study was taking a firmly em empathetic approach, understanding men both as gendered but also as emotional beings and focused on three behaviors in particular, which were alcohol use, sexual behavior, and violence. So um, I'm going to talk today about the qualitative component of the study, although it was a mixed method study, which focused on upon married men aged 20 to 52 living in Dharavi. It involved in-depth in individual interviews with 29 men and um, was supplemented with focus groups. And just to tell you a bit about the area where the research was carried out. so. I was working with the Centre for Vulnerable Women and Children at Sneha, which is a large maternal and child health NGO in, in Mumbai. And so they work pre predominantly with women who are victims of intimate partner violence, and then also in the community, and increasingly were wanting to work with men. And so we're very interested in the research. So they were very much partners in the research. So Dharavi is a very heterogeneous area. There's people come from all over India to migrate to Dharavi. And so you have people not only from different regions, but also different religious backgrounds, different castes, living in a very small space. And so there's a lot of migration. And although there's a lot of industry in Dharavi, it's predominantly characterized as being a low-income area. And so there are a lot of issues over job insecurity, unemployment, and underemployment. 
So I'm just going to, in two slides, go over some of the key findings and here just briefly discuss some of the structural factors very briefly which emerged as, as important. And while obviously there was a whole range of different men, these are some of the issues which affected quite a, a few men and were quite high, high issues which men brought up to themselves. So kind of the overarching theme really is the rapid economic and cultural change going on and, and how this affects a whole different other aspects and have both social life and, and for individuals. And think about economic inequalities, as I said, un unemployment, underemployment, job insecurity, and a continual struggle to provide. Um, migration, men moving away from the village to the city without family or without wives or with, and the difficulties of that. Big change in terms of changing gender norms, both in terms of masculinities and femininities, and really quite large change happening in some ways, but also obviously some re resistance to change. And, and for many men, talking about the changing position of women as being important in terms of in their, in their life and, and some of the factors which came out. And then changes in family structures and the move from arranged marriages to an idea of intimacy and love within a marriage. And so there, there are obviously other issues and one could go on, but the, really the, the key point of the research was to say that there were a whole series of structural factors which were affecting men and women's lives as, as much as men, but really to focus the fact that these range of, of factors had profound emotional impact for many men. There are obviously, again, a range of men who are affected in different ways. But really, what I was trying to draw, draw out of the study was the mechanism by which these structural factors affect individuals and lead to, to um, influence, really, individual behavior. So thinking about the mechanisms, and <clears throat> here I'm just going to um, unpack that a little. So we can think of perhaps the most uh, the key issue which m a lot of men spoke about was stress, tension, and difficulties surrounding the failure to provide adequately for one's family and how this really combined with, for many men, emotional isolation and poor emotional support. Uh, and, and I'll come on to some quotes which will illustrate this perhaps more clearly. It's really to look at the way in which men's support systems and the way in which men coped with the stress and tension and really emotion which resulted from what might we might think as more structural factors. So key things were communication difficulties between couples and uh, men having very limited communication with their wives. And this is not all men at all, but obviously um, a, a subsection of men who this was the case. And then who also had difficulties or had no real communication with other men other than very, very short conversations. And so really a picture for many men of real emotional isolation. And the use of alcohol and extramarital sex as ways of coping with difficult emotions and seeking and gaining intimacy and affection through use of extramarital sex. <clears throat> so really what I want to draw out, and when we're going through the few quotes in the next few slides, is the importance of pleasure and positive emotion associated with what we might consider risk behavior. So um, this is Pankaj, he's 24 years old, and he is married, he has an arranged marriage to a woman who comes from a rural area who's recent, who's moved to Mumbai two years ago um, when she married, when they became married. And he really told us of his, his isolation and here he talks about why he goes to a sex worker. So Pankaj says, first they will make you relax, then put their hands on you, caress you, kiss you, they'll give you some time. You too will want to kiss, touch her or kiss her. I don't get that at home, I get it there with a the sex worker. They will press me or touch, he, touch here and there and kiss me. I get aroused when I go to Chalpati, which is a local beach, and see couples sitting and kissing on their own, then I think I also want something like that. <clears throat> so Pankaj talks about actually a lot of the reasons why he goes and sees, and, and he's been to many, many sex workers, and talk very much about his, his prime motivation, really, rather than being simply penetrative sex. And here he's actually talking about why he goes to a particular brothel, uh, uh, rather than a street sex worker because he says in the bungalows you get given more time and it's more about affection and receiving and, and, and generating some kind of intimacy 
whereas with the street sex worker, it's, it's um, a much shorter, more about penetrative sex. So Sachin, this is just another example of a man who is not having sex with a sex worker, but actually with a, another a woman in the community. He talks about his continual relationship with her and very much about it being an emotional relationship, and that's why the main reason why he feels he's going outside of his marriage, really. So he says, we talk about so many things. Nothing is hidden. I like to talk openly. I still have a relationship with her. I mean, apart from my wife, I keep relation with her also and also with my wife. But our relationship is much better than that with my wife. Uh, so then I'm just going on to talk about alcohol use, and Harish talks about his use of alcohol. He says, if a person is happy or if he has money, he will not do any intoxication. But due to this tension, he's talking about the tension of, of not being able to provide. And his wife saying, these things are not there. There is no money. He thinks it's better to drink and go home and sleep quietly. So one drinks for taking out his tension. And really, uh, uh, many men who talked about the importance of alcohol and relieving tension, coping with emotion and stress, aiding sleep, escaping the problems of home and the difficulties of providing economically. So um, here are just two quotes. Again, here's one from Pankaj, who I talked about in terms of his extramarital sex. He talks about his relationship with his wife here, and he says, I feel she is different and I am different. It's just like a woman staying at my home. I'm not that close to her. I don't even look into her eyes. We do not talk to each other as if we're having a fight between us. It is not like I take her out or discuss about our future. There is nothing of that sort. We don't talk like that. And then Ismail says, when we ask him at the end of the interview how he felt about the interview, he says, I felt nice that I can offload the burden from my heart, which I can't do with anyone. I have spoken from my heart and I felt nice about it. And really, I can put these quotes in to show that actually both Pankaj and Ismail are, are very um, very able to talk about their emotions and, and actually enjoy in the interviews, enjoy the ability to, the opportunity to speak and having an outlet or a means for expression. But actually they're in their, their lives, they're completely isolated both in terms of their wife and then other men and have very little outlet for discussing emotion with others. However, coming to the end of that, we can think about um, the, the title of the talk, which was a question rather than um, a kind of that I'm going to talk about this. And obviously there's a big question of, or do we, how far really do we do we think about these issues? And a lot of people find perhaps the way I've talked about things today quite challenging. And so thinking about some of the reasons why there's a kind of rejection of, of this kind of empathetic approach towards men's behavior. So we can think about there's a limited pot of money, and women are more vulnerable, more victimized, and more in need of help. And, and these two are, you know, both very real considerations. Impossible to bring about change with men, which I'd obviously challenge more. Um, or we should focus solely upon men's claims to beliefs in, in power. And obviously that still remains very important. Or that this is a Western perspective, and the idea of emotion um, it comes from perhaps more of a Western school of thought. But I'd want to make the argument here, really, um, if we go on to the next slide, that these things have implications for current interventions, whether we decide to go out and spend money working particularly with, with men in a particular way or not. If we think about many existing interventions, they involve changing couple dynamics. <clears throat> and so understanding how interventions affect men and change the relationship between men and women is really crucial in maximizing their success. So we could think about, and Sneha was very involved in encouraging women to go out to work, microcredit, and we can think about how those two, which we might consider quite structural um, interventions, empowering of women, but really what the work with the interviews with men whose wives had been involved in that was how the success of those interventions very much were dependent upon on the couple dynamics, and it seemed that when it was successful, there was very much an idea of working on common problems together, on coming together and understanding each other's problems and, and the wife understanding the economic difficulties more and improving communication between the couple. So we can think about in terms of existing interventions and actually that these things are going on, these complexities, and we really need to understand them. We can also think about getting men on board and engaging hard to reach men and men who are use alcohol um, have real alcohol issues or who are visiting sex workers very regularly and how we engage these men. Um, and hopefully the next couple of slides will just demonstrate this a little. So 
This is Ishmael who talks about his wife going out to work, which Sneha encourages, and he used to he used to be violent. He was a perpetrator. He, he was violent towards his wife. This is kind of some time later when we're interviewing him. So he says, mentally, sometimes we go into depression when we see others who've moved forward in life. He has his own house, and we're still in the rented house, and the costs have become too much these days. When we hear about the inflation of prices, we feel like crying because costs have increased so much. Once we both even cried. And, and he kind of says, this is a kind of separate part of the interview, but we ask him, well, how is it before? And he says, previously, everything had to be new. And he's talking about his wife here. So if you want to buy anything, buy a new one. And if I want this thing, it means I want this one only. I will only buy these clothes and not those clothes. It was like this. When Snehir explained about family, money, and household, that you should support each other both with sorrow and joy. If you're beside him in the days of sorrow, he'll be with you in the days of joy also. And really, it's just trying to pull out that even though it was quite a structural, you can think about it just in terms of it was about empowering the wife, it was about her going out to work. How really the framing of it in terms of bringing them together and sharing the problems and, and facing a common problem together. And then there's just the next slide, it's from Pankaj, who I spoke about earlier. He says, the people from NGOs, they only tell me, use a condom, use a condom, as if they're encouraging me to go there. Like, go and use a condom, go and use condoms. But there's nobody who's asking me about my life. Like, how do you live your life? Need any weed about So just the final slide, um, a few conclusions. Um, Firstly, saying we need to recognize the disparate ways we still approach understanding men and women's risk of HIV. Key to make the point that it's not about losing players the need to address gender inequality or challenging men's gender privileges. That still remains incredibly important. But it is in terms of saying we need better understanding of the ways in which structural factors affect men's vulnerability to HIV. And we need to recognize men as both gendered and emotional beings and recognize the role of positive emotion and pleasure and how that relates to men's emotional um, experience when we think about what we might consider risk behavior. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is John Kandarele from WRHI in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I had um, I have a question for the first speaker, Ben. Was that Ben? Yes. Yes. Uh, slide number four. He talked about uh, intervention. This slide about uh, neuro circumcision. Um, I wanted to find out if you make the distinction between medical male circumcision and um, um, and regular circumcision. Um, yeah, so I, I guess really the point there was just thinking about um, how we think about biological, social, you know, social structures, different layers and different levels. Uh, and, and different ways in which um, both biological sex and um, and gender um, affect uh, risk and, and vulnerability to HIV. So uh, I'm not a particular specialist in um, in 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 melting soon, but um, but looking at just as an example of uh, a more biomedical intervention. But I suppose the other thing would be to say that even having said that, that there's obviously the opportunity to use biomedical interventions such as circumcision as uh, an opportunity for thinking about um, other more social and structural interventions we might want to do at the same time. I don't know whether that helps. <laughs> what is your general sense, based on what you're learning and and and, and sort of what you saw, what is your general sense about how you would take those insights um, and integrate it in a programmatic way? Um, mm -hmm. and, and how might that be different uh, based on sort of the approach you, you're suggesting from some of the other approaches that have uh, that we see a lot 
in terms of, of reaching out to men and trying, you know, to kind of uh, build gender equitable uh, appreciation amongst men. Mm. So for me, the kind of one of the key things is really thinking about what we mean when we talk about gender equality, and when um, I guess the first thing to say is obviously the different levels at which we could intervene. And even though the charity I was working with, Sneha, was doing intensive counselling, individual and couple counselling, which has a role, obviously in terms of what's um, uh, manage what's uh, economically feasible. Um, that's not, you know, it, it's it's feasible for a charity to do it in a small level. But really, the important thing for me is thinking about how we think about these issues going upwards. If you see, or like from from the emotional to back to more social structural issues. And so for me, it's kind of thinking about social norms, but around issues perhaps which we talk less about, which is emotional well-being and health among men. Um, so one thing is thinking that when we talk about masculine norms or masculinities or talking about programs with men, that while it's really important to talk about men's views of, about violence and men's views towards women, there are, there are other issues other than those two issues, even though those are incredibly important and they need to be a fundamental, you know, the core part is, of any intervention with, with men is talking about their claims to power, beliefs in power. But the real issue for me is how if you sit down with a group of men, and this is Sneha's challenge, is what do you start talking to them about? Or if you go into the community, what do you start talking about? And if you go into the community and talk about and, and start challenging really men's beliefs, men's claims to power, power immediately, who are the men who engage with that message and who don't? And if I go with them, as I did with to kind of White Ribbon Day events, um, and it's about norms around violence, does that change behavior or not? And thinking really whether we're continually talking to men who are non-violent, who don't use alcohol, who get the message, who are happy and want to be gender equitable and kind of aspire to being gender equitable, which is fantastic. But really more how we reach the men who are being violent or who are, have real alcohol abuse issues or having le lots of extramarital sex and, and whether the way in which we frame discussion with men um, is really um, the most effective. And so for me, the issue is about how we engage with different groups of men. So just to kind of a couple of examples, one is Sneha going into the community and trying to talk to a group of village elder, of, of elders and they're all men in the 60s, 70, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, beginning by talking about um, a woman who's experienced violence um, was incredibly difficult, and the men didn't want to talk about it and didn't recognize it as a problem. And so Nairin, who's the director, has found that incredibly difficult, but thinking about other ways which those men might relate to or, or might take an interest in as a way into then talking about other gender uh, gender issues, and definitely including power in that. But so perhaps talking about alcohol use and men's alcohol problems with alcohol, which is very much related to to use of violence, as a way in of talking to other uh, about other issues. Um, but for me, the idea is is really having sat down, obviously, with lots of different men and, and witnessed conversations. Is what are those men? How do those men frame their stories and frame their problems? Um, and given that many of these men are actually feel, feel their main feeling is a feeling of disempowerment, to start talking about challenging those men's power is very, is very as the first thing or one of the main things you talk about is very difficult. And so it's framing it in a way which you you're just recognising the position that man is in, and and by doing that, kind of um, gaining more of a, a hook in, really, rather than men being able to dismiss it as saying, oh, this is not relevant to me, I don't, you know, this still isn't relevant to my situation. So for me, that's the kind of core of, of just of looking at how emotion and emotional experience, really, men, um, is, is a way in of thinking about work with men, future work with men. I, I guess one of the things that comes across to me in your uh, quotes is how some of this seems 
driven, or at least the narrative that men give, is that what drives them into to, to drink or what drives them to ha have see sex workers and things is is not having a good relationship or communication or intimacy in their primary relationship. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether or not you, what do you feel is the opportunity, if any, to start the discussion not just with men, but sort of not necessarily with couples as couples, like couples counseling, mm -hmm. but to basically start the discussion about in single sex groups and then in joint sex group, groups about you know relationships and and couples and communication and and sort of that as an entry point um, mm -hmm. or do you think that um, you know I, I guess that, you know do you think that might be a possible point of entry for these discussions as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, so the interesting thing is that a lot of the men spoke of wanting more intimacy with their wife, both in terms of sexual intimacy and also emotional. Um, and obviously there are a whole load of barriers around in terms of femininities and feminine norms which made it very difficult for women to engage with a lot of the discussions really which men were wanting to have. But obviously there, there, there must be many issues. This is a study which is limited by speaking only to men, but similar issues really for um and a whole range of issues for, for women over communication in the relationship. Um, but I suppose the other the thing to say is that there were good examples of change and being brought about by Sneha. And the way in which getting the family to sit down together every day at the end of the day for 15 minutes is a very kind of clear intervention and sit down and ask each other how your day was and what happened. Um, and one man spoke about the importance of that in, com in combination with decreasing his alcohol use. Um, but really, the, the main thing there is, is, uh, is the ability to empathize with others and empathize with your wife and understand her problems and issues as well as your own. Um, and that really came across very strongly as in, in the very strong relationships um, that men had a good uh, were very much empathetic towards their, their wives. And so how you kind of um, build upon that and the importance of that, and perhaps that's much more complex in terms of how we bring up boys um, and how boys are brought up, um, but that there is possibility for change and that it's kind of wanted, there's a, there's a, a desire for change, um, but thinking about ways in which you can bring that about. But yeah, absolutely, that's a very, very fertile area for intervention. Thank you.